These dots in the middle of the Saudi Arabian desert can even be seen from space. They are crop circles, farming the unfarmable, and wind turbines which make it rain where it almost never rains. Real game changes to combat expanding deserts? Humans are driving the transformation of arid lands into vast sandscapes hostile to life, putting a billion livelihoods at risk. So what if we could revitalize and restore what's been lost? We have no doubt about the possibility, the viability of this idea. Scientists are exploring incredible ways to green the desert, but can they really stop sand from swallowing up the world? This is the fastest growing desert on the planet. The Gobi, which means waterless place in Mongolian, stretches across Mongolia and China. It devours about 6,000 square kilometers of grassland per year, engulfing villages and turning landscapes into uninhabitable wasteland. Tens of thousands of people have become environmental migrants forced to resettle elsewhere. Only a couple of thousand people are left. The reason why Gobi and other deserts are expanding is partly due to changing climate cycles affecting the rainfall, but human-driven global warming is also fueling this process. Some 3,000 kilometers from the Gobi, in the deserts of Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, the Aral Sea is drying up, mainly because of industrial farming. This, but also extreme droughts, deforestation and overgrazing have severely degraded once fertile soils. This man-made destruction is called desertification, and it's happening on a global scale. By the middle of the century, 25% of the world's soils will be affected. We don't have a solid base upon which people's livelihoods can, they can depend on that land. Everything else becomes precarious. This is Dr. Baron Joseph Orr, lead scientist for the United Nations Conventions to Combat Desertification. His job is to find solutions to help the half a billion people whose livelihoods are already hard hit by desertification and the other half a billion who are at risk. Most live in Southeast Asia, the Middle East, the Sahara region and North Africa. The good news, the situation is not hopeless. Remember the green dots from the very beginning? As small as they seem, each one is actually a round field, one kilometer in diameter in the heart of the desert. They are a symbol of Saudi Arabia's agricultural expansion since the 1970s. Now, wheat and other crops cover vast areas. That's incredibly water intensive. Farmers tapped water from the last ice age, one kilometer underground. But obviously, there is a catch. They went for crops that were highly productive in agriculture, but also thirsty, demanding a lot of water. So your sustainability of the system is very low. Monocultural farming depletes soil, so it cannot retain water in the long term. But that is key. It only rains a few centimeters of average rainfall per year. That can't refill the aquifers. Experts estimate that the pumps will need to be turned off in about 50 years. The desert sands will reconquer the artificial oasis. But there are more sustainable ways of using water in the desert. On Saudi Arabia's west coast, a different experiment is going on. An initiative called the El Baitha Project has developed a system for regenerating the land using flash floods. Yes, you heard right, flash floods in the middle of the desert. These videos shared on social media in 2021 show what rainfall in Saudi Arabia can look like. But most of the valuable fresh water in the region runs off or evaporates. We said, okay, well, if we can catch flash floods and get that water in the ground, then that becomes a sustainable source of water, even if it's only happening, you know, every 18 months or every 20 months or whatever. This is Nils Beckman, specialist in regenerative agriculture and former director of the Al Baitha project. Together with the local community, Neil Spackman and other agricultural specialists have been building dams, terraces and kilometers of ditches. The idea is to channel the floodwaters to where they are needed and retain them. There, they can be reabsorbed. These are methods that the likes of the Incas used hundreds of years ago. 
So it's slowing down the water first with those human scale earthworks. Physically, that allows for biology to get established and then you're slowing down the water ecologically. At first, artificial irrigation was needed to promote plant growth and get the ecological cycle started again. But then, by harvesting flash floods, significantly more water could be put in the ground than taken out. Native trees, bushes and grasses even survived a 30-month drought without additional irrigation. We had birds come back, we had small mammals come back. It was quite amazing to witness, actually, to, to see life coming back to this place. The project has been up and running since 2010. It has proved that it's possible to restore water tables in the desert. The next challenge is to increase agricultural output to make people in the area self-sufficient again. Even the Sahara was green for a brief period. Thousands of years ago, monsoon rains made the desert a habitable place. Today, the Sahara is rocky and sandy, and in some areas, it is expanding by almost 48 kilometers per year. Man-made activities in the surrounding drylands mean it's the globe's most threatened place in terms of desertification. That process is fueling land conflicts in a region that's already poverty-stricken. Solar and wind farms could potentially put an end to this, not only by creating energy, but by making it rain. Scientists have developed a climate model showing that if one-fifth of the entire Sahara were covered with solar farms and wind farms, there would be five centimeters more rainfall in the Sahel region. That might not sound like much, but it would increase vegetation cover by almost 20%. How does it work? Well, the black surface of the solar panels heats up the air, making it rise to higher altitudes. The wind turbine's rotation has a similar effect. So it goes up, and then this upward motion, it carries the moisture with it. So, and the upward motion, when it reaches the higher altitudes, it will cool, because higher altitudes are cooler, lower pressure, so it's colder. And the moisture condenses, becomes rain, and falls down. This is Dr. Safa Mote. He's a physicist researching how to prevent environmental, economic and social catastrophes. Theoretically, at least, the model would boost plant growth on a huge scale running from East to West Africa across the Sahel region. We believe that this will, uh, this will uh, significantly improve rain-fed agriculture and will significantly improve uh, food production in the, uh, in the region. The additional vegetation will give us um, improvement of ecosystems in, in the area. So it's a win-win situation for the environment, for the economy, and for the people. The gigantic energy park would create more than four times the energy currently consumed globally each year. The scientists believe it could be used to contribute to clean development in an array of different ways in Africa, from infrastructure to the desalination of seawater. You might want to watch a video we did on the topic. But all in all, the logistics and politics of transporting the energy and the estimated costs of some $20 trillion make the project seem rather unfeasible. And there are cheaper ways of reclaiming the desert. What started out as a project to protect the transportation routes of a local salt mine in the Kubuki desert has become a huge reforestation operation. A city used to be besieged by desert, now is a paradise. At the end of the 20th century, deserted land increased by 10,000 square kilometers every year. Now it decreases by over 2,000 square kilometers annually. This isn't just government propaganda. The Kubuki Desert is seen as one of the world's most successful restoration projects. And by working in a systematic and collaborative way like that, they were successful. New seeding methods have played a decisive role in the reforestation of thousands of square kilometers since 1988. Special water jets create a hole in the sand and simultaneously water the cutting. And they reduce the, the, the planting time from something like 10 minutes per, per tree or per, per seedling if it, was, if it was crops, down to, I think, 10 seconds. I mean, very, very powerful and, and important change. 
In the Kyubuki Desert, farmers also started putting straw bales around the young plants on the dunes to protect them from the wind, so they have a real chance of growing. Huge desertified areas have become green again. Some are now being used for cattle grazing and crop farming. Licorice and other herbs suitable for this climate are also grown here. They are in high demand in traditional Chinese medicine. And yet the region does not consume much more water than what it receives in annual rainfall. They thought about the market, they thought about the startup costs, they thought about the social practices in the grazing areas. They addressed all of these, not just one location where they were doing restoration, but the entire region. A huge variety of animals, from gazelles to hedgehogs, sparrows and wild geese, returned to the region. Greening the Kyuboki is even helping Beijing, 800 kilometers away. The desert's restoration has decreased air pollution by sandstorms in the Chinese capital significantly. So, reversing desertification is possible. We can restore soils, water cycles and vegetation to protect the livelihoods of millions of people with natural or high-tech methods. But what is also clear, the cost and the efforts involved in the process mean that we will never be able to turn all the world's desertified land into fertile soil. The foundation of all life on the planet. Um, but we need to find ways to value those and to beyond, beyond the concept of conservation, right? Beyond the concept of, you know, it's nice to have nature. It's not nice to have, it's necessary. To stop desertification and desert expansion, scientists know what needs to be done. Curb global warming and the overexploitation of oil soils and deforestation in areas where soils are at risk of degradation. That will keep the planet's landmass healthy and able to maintain humankind and its health. Don't get me wrong, deserts are absolutely fascinating and unique ecosystems worthy of protection. The problem begins when fertile soils turn into dust and sand. Fun fact, the biggest known underground water source lies under the Sahara. What do you think about greening deserts? If you liked the video, subscribe to our channel and give us a like.